Good evening. It's wonderful to be back here. About five years ago, I was here in a slightly different setting, conducting the Greensboro Symphony on this wonderful stage and great acoustics. <laughs> now we have a little bit of enhancement. Just last week, I was conducting in Moscow a wonderful piece by the great American composer Leonard Bernstein. The work is called, the composition is called Serenade, and it's based on Plato's Symposium, where famous poets, philosophers like Socrates, and playwrights like Aristophanes, and even a doctor gathered together and talked about love, various sides of love. Sort of like the TED Talk of the ancient Greeks. Now, the curiosity has been something that been sort of the driving force in my life. First of all, we're given curiosity right from the start. The children have the most amazing curiosity about it, and no fear, the best kind. They're fearless. Once they realize that they can get hurt, burned, God forbid, too cold, too hot, we all start developing as we grow up various fears. And the conquering of that fear is very important because if you pursue your curiosity, it will inevitably bring you great rewards in your creativity. That's pretty much the story of my life, and I will try to condense it to a few minutes that we are all given here. So I was born to really musical royalty of the Soviet cultural life. My mother, who is alive and well, living now in New York City, is one of the greatest pianists of the 20th century, one of the most important Chopin interpreters of all times. My father, Julian Sitkovetsky, holding me rather, I was a heavy child. But, yeah. <laughs> Just the cheeks alone, you know, already. Anyway, so he was a wonderful man, but unfortunately he lived a very short life, and he passed away at the age of 32, leaving a very very, very big shoes to fill. And of course, it was decided for me that I just have to be not only a musician, a fourth professional generation of performing musicians, but particularly a violinist. In those days, I was not opposed to the idea at all, as you can see. <laughs> I was already at the age of three conducting with a bow sort of anticipating things to come. And everything was going well, and I was given, of course, in the Soviet Union, they had the best possible uh, early education and all the best schools. I went to the central music schools, great teachers and everything. And would you know, the genes are a very, very important thing in this hall. And since I had it from both sides, by the time I was 12 years old, I already won my first international competition in Prague. And here, those who can read Russian, you could see it's a, it's, it's a little clip from the paper of 1966, more than 50 years ago, my God, it seems like yesterday. Anyway, my wife always tells me that I'm not made for comfort. As soon as I arrive at the point where the road is clear, everything's set, and all I need is just to stay the course, and everything will be wonderful. I tend to get restless and curious. What if I didn't go that route? What if I went sideways? What if I tried something else? And of course, in Russia in those days, being a concert musician was a very, very desirable, very important uh, position. But along with all the advantages, it made you not to ask questions, accept all the conditions, 
which was really against my nature. So what was it being a musician? This was not a job. It was not a profession. It was a calling. And there was a price to pay, which I was not necessarily willing to do. Now, what I started to do was reading. This is Moscow, of course, in the 70s. That was, uh, for those of us who come from there, it would be a little bit of a nostalgic sh shot. But it was a complicated place. And many things were not allowed. So I was reading the forbidden literature of Solzhenitsyn and Sakharov and Zinoviev and so forth. I was singing forbidden songs. Believe it or not, in those days, the Beatles songs and Rolling Stones were forbidden in Soviet Union. And I was listening to The Voice of America and BBC. And it, that made me a natural rebel. So it was clear that I was not going to stay the course. So by the age of 22, I made a very important decision. I decided to give it all up and to leave all my friends and family and become persona non grata. Once you immigrate from Russia, you knew in those days, it was 77, it was exactly 40 years ago that I left uh, Soviet Union and never looked back because at that time there was no, not possible to come back. So I arrived in New York City there it is. And nobody knew who I was. Nobody knew my parents. I sort of pressed, in those days we didn't know the meaning, the reset button, and started from ground zero. I welcomed that challenge because apart from all the oppressive quality of the Soviet regime, even more for me was to get away from the expectations of the family because I just had to walk on water from the age of three since I was the son of, so forth. Here, nobody knew who I was. I had to start all over again, and I welcomed this. New York was a fabulous place. It was dirty, it was dangerous, but it was incredibly free. I felt it belonged to me as much as to Nelson Rockefeller. It was my city. I embraced everything Juilliard School, which accepted me in my first week upon arrival in September 77. It will be exactly 40 years. So I just took advantage of everything. I never played as much chamber music. I never did as, uh, I saw so much opera, ballet, theater. It, everything was free. Juilliard School is a fantastic school. And so I was able to combine the two big influences, the great Russian training, great school, and also the whole new free world. So before too long, two years later, after I graduated from Juilliard, I played in my last competition by the age of 25. I was lucky to win it, even though by that time I was already not representing any country, because under my name was written stateless. I was a refugee. And uh, as my wife, Often, after we met and I was introduced to her as this Russian refugee, whenever I do something good, something unexpected, she would always say, not bad for a refugee. So, <laughs> so now I'm going to play. Hopefully I won't let her down. Because I brought an old friend here, a 300-year-old friend. I will tell you about him. I will play for you a work by Johann Sebastian Bach for violin solo which is called Gavot and Rondo from Partita E Major.
So this is my violin, which is celebrates, which celebrates this year 300 years anniversary. It's a Stradivari violin made in Cremona in 1717. Now, I bought this violin. I was very lucky to buy it early because today I could only look at it, but the, I can't even come near. The prices are so high. So I bought it in 83, which was a wonderful year for me because I got married. I got my American citizenship, so I was no longer a refugee. And uh, I also got completely fascinated by a piece written for piano, the greatest piece for keyboard perhaps ever by Johann Sebastian Bach, the Goldberg Variations. Now, I was so curious to know how is it possible to be part of it, because I was completely obsessed with the late recording of the Glenn Gould, the genius Canadian pianist. And I bought this score, I was listening to it all the time, and as a result, I spent two most joyful, exhilarating months of my life in company with Johann Sebastian Bach and Glenn Gould. Not bad for, for a company for two months. So, as a result, this trio that you hear now was born, but my colleagues really thought I was out of my mind. Goldberg Variations for String Trio, what do you think? It's absolutely impossible. But somehow it became very successful, and now it's played all over the world, and there are even groups that call themselves the Goldberg Trio. So after that, I was working a lot in Finland. Finland is a beautiful country, a country of 40,000 lakes. And I was given a wonderful musical laboratory. I was director of a music festival there. So I was able to do all my experiments there. And that was not enough. So I thought by 1990, I thought, what if I project my life story? On one hand, I was clearly a Russian-trained, Russian-born, Russian-trained artist. What if? But on the other hand, I was becoming more and more Western. What if I combine that and put it in the body of strings? So I got my great friends. By that time, Berlin Wall had already fallen down, so I was able to get my old friends from Russia, new friends from the West. And what it turned out to be is, was a remarkable group of like-minded people, which became my musical family. I called it the New European Strings, NAS Chamber Orchestra, and it had the great mastery of the instruments that was a given, great intensity of the Russian players, wonderful energy of the American players, and great sophistication of the style of the Europeans. The side effect of, by the way, with this orchestra, I also been on this stage even earlier in 2005, we were part of this, so I'm kind of getting used to the coming here. It's a lovely, lovely place. So, uh, as a side effect of this, I became, this, there's my group, by the way, I shouldn't forget about this picture, but as a side effect of this was the fact that I became a conductor, because I was conducting this orchestra, traveling around the world, started getting guest conducting engagement, and in 2003, I came almost next door to you, to the wonderful city of Greensboro, where I thought that maybe I was given a chance to be the head of the Greensboro Symphony, the music director. And I thought, could I really bring all these activities that I've accumulated, uh, the ones that I mentioned, the playing, the conducting, the chamber music, and even my transcriptions, all under one roof. And it turned out to be the most wonderful, now 15 years and counting, and now we're really in great anticipation, waiting for the new Tanger Art Center, which cannot open too soon, but it's going to be at least two more years of great anticipation and waiting. That's going to be definitely the focal point of the arts and the home of the Greensboro Symphony. And I hope it will be an important uh, you know, cultural hub now. So I've been very, very lucky all my life to be able to get curious, conquer my fear. And the orchestra is a wonderful, uh, you know, orchestra is a fantastic invention of our civilization. It has no difference of age, sex, race, religion, and politics. 
And when you get together this group and you have a great piece of music together on mass, they're able to get to the level where individually none of them can get. That's the miracle of music. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure.